morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Or Joyce Gibson would say, good morning to you all. Um, welcome here. I'm glad you're here. Uh, now it's captive audience, so I will have, be able to do some propaganda. Um, this morning I was worried I would forget something. In fact, I did. It reminded me of this, this joke about these two friends in Florida, and uh, one visited the other one after several days, and said, "They say, what, what, what are you doing? Anything interesting?" Said, no, no. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, we went to a restaurant last night. Oh, the food was terrific. There was lots of it, and it wasn't expensive at all. So, what's the name of the restaurant? The name of the restaurant. The name of the restaurant. Um, what's the name of that flower that is red and smells so good and has thorns? Oh, you mean a rose? It says, yeah, a rose. Uh, hey, Rose, what's the name of that? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, um, I, I brought one catalog, or a of catalogs, just to illustrate some points that I needed to make. And I brought some seeds that I have saved, and what seeds look like, and I would like to talk about selection and storage. And um, I also brought a few books. I still have some left books that uh, my wife and I wrote uh, in 99. It's, they're out of print, but I have a few left, and if you are interested, what the book has is a list of seeds, uh, or plants, how long the, what the longevity of the seeds are, when you need to start them, and how to store them, where to collect them, and so on. And the first item on the agenda is for me to show you a PowerPoint I did um, originally, a little bit amended over that time, but origin originally in 2007, because uh, there was an exhibit at, uh, at Bates College called Green Horizons, and uh, what I did was to collect uh, an array of slides of, uh, of their slides, digital photographs of my garden and uh, why it's important for everybody to garden and why it's important for you to save seeds. Uh, what is happening, of course, is that all the seed is being controlled by very few corporations. And the more the seed is sources are controlled, of course, the fewer options there are for us. All the seed is, not all, but most of the seed that is being offered now is either hybridized or genetically engineered. You won't concern yourself with genetically engineered because primarily that is designed for farmers in large scale farming. But hybridized seed also limits your versatility and options in saving the seed because you don't know the parentage and because the seeds of hybrids either may not be viable, if they are viable, meaning they won't germinate. If they're viable, they will either produce a plant that has really no resemblance to what you saw in the garden, so it will be a waste of your time to save those seeds. Or if the seed germinates and produces a plant and produces fruit, the fruit will not resemble anything that you have seen in the garden. In other words, there will be incredible variability. And I will talk about that a little bit later. This, uh, this PowerPoint is about 18 minutes long, and it has uh, 124 slides. And the music is by Schubert. So I hope that you enjoy Schubert. And I'll start it from the beginning, shut off the lights, and then I will have a chance to talk.
So, um, what I thought I would do for another 15 minutes, talk about considerations and saving seeds. And, uh, and then answer questions. The most important aspect of saving seeds, of course, is that you have to start with a plant where you can save seeds. And if a plant that, uh, that you raise was started from a hybrid, you can save seeds, but as I said before, you might not be able to get anything out of it. We generally, if we save seeds, we have to have a population. You can't grow one plant and make decision on one plant. And population means if you have 100 squashes or 100 squash plants, you have to make a choice. And that choice is based on characteristics of that particular plant. For instance, this is butternut squash, uh, Waltham butternut. And you can see they're different shapes. So if you have a vine with one squash like this, you say, well, that's terrific. But then if you have another vine with 100 squashes like this, you say, well, maybe that is terrific. And you might want to choose this one because of the productivity or the amount of volume you get. You may want to look at the shape. For instance, here, this is the seed cavity. And here, all of this is, is meat. So the cost effectiveness of raising this obviously is greater than cost effectiveness of raising this, where a seed cavity takes more than 75% of the, uh, of the um, squash. And if you look at choices that you want to make based on uh, the quality, what qualities you look for? Let's say you have a tomato. You have a tomato that is the earliest. Well, that's the one you want to save rather than the one you want to eat. Well, you, with tomato, it's a bad example because you can eat it and save it too. You just, you just, uh, it's like the cake. But you scoop out the seeds, you use the seeds for fermenting, you put it in a little dish, it starts smelling. And the reason you start to ferment it is because you want to get all that pulp off it. That's about the only way you can get it. It won't spoil the seed. And, and then when you, when you have enough fermenting, usually it takes about a week or, or a week and a half. Uh, you can put a, a screen over it so that flies don't get into it and start uh, depositing their eggs and then you have a whole bunch of maggots. Uh, but fermentation is good. It destroys the pulp then you can run those seeds under water in a sieve, just rub it against the sides, rinse it again, put it on a piece of newspaper. Most likely, the best kind of newspaper to dry it on would be uh, the coated kind, you know, the clay coated, Sunday section, that kind of. And the reason for that is because the seeds don't stick. If you put the seeds on a newspaper, uh, or if you use paper towels, then the seeds will stick to the paper towels. You can still put paper towels underneath that glossy section, but you don't want to have to scrape them off later on when they dry. After that, all you do is paper bag them. It's called brown bagging. If you don't have paper bags like this, you can make a little container like this, you just bend three sections, bend this end, and tuck it in and create an envelope just out of a piece of paper. So there's not much work really. Then you label, label the year you collected those, and, and then you will know uh, years from now. With tomato seeds, they will last in storage at room temperature for 10 to 15 years. Wow. With pepper seeds, maybe four years. With carrot seed, maybe two to three years. <clears throat> Parsley, all members of umbellifera family, uh, the ones that have these umbels like dill, uh, carrots, 
uh, carrots, uh, celery. All of those are very, have very short longevity, meaning that they will deteriorate because the seed itself is alive, of course. And eventually it dehydrates, uh, cosmic rays hit it, and alter the gene structure so they will not germinate. And there, of course, is progressive deterioration. Um, as the seed gets older, a smaller proportion germinates. If you have very good catalogs, those catalogs will tell you the germination rates. For instance, you buy a packet of seeds. Out of 100 seeds, you should not expect 100, 100 seeds to germinate. You should expect a certain proportion. If it goes below 50, it's a waste of your money, right? But all seed companies are supposed to test the germination rates. And how do you know when the seeds are ready? Generally, when the seed pod turns brown. Let me, let me bring up a point about squashes. Obviously, you don't see any seed pod here. This is a fruit, right? But I'm storing these from last summer. And in fact, I'm using them throughout the winter and through the spring. Well, what is another quality that I desire? Another quality is the storage capacity. If I can hold them until June, I know that they are very durable. That is a desirable characteristic because all seeds or all plants, if they were ultimately storable, you would be able to use them for longer than just one year. If you store potatoes, which are propagated by cuttings of the potato itself, you can really only store it for a year. You can't store it for two years. If you think about the progression of agriculturists from the time that agriculture started some 10, 12,000 years ago to now, one of the biggest problems had to do with storage. Because not only are we storing the seed for ourselves, but we are storing them for the insects, for the mice, and so on. So domestication really started with a dovetail. So if you have if you're storing grain, you need containers. If you're storing uh, vegetables, you need to keep pests away. Now, imagine 8,000 years ago when you had to invent some, some way of storing your seeds. Well, you had obviously mice and insects. And one of the reasons we have cats is because we didn't want to sit in the cave and and throw rocks at all the mice, you know, that wanted to, uh, to take away our grain. So several considerations in storing it. Um, if you, with some, like these, these are small jalapeno peppers. Let's say I plant 100 plants. Some are hot, some are sweet, which shouldn't be, right? But but in, in any population, you have incredible variability. So when you look at some pepper, for instance, you want to choose the characteristic that is desirable for you. In this case, I just dry these instead of taking them out and uh, saving the seeds. But if I wanted to, if I wanted to get the, at the seeds, all I have to do is break this, shake out a few seeds, be sure not to rub your eyes in this. Uh, <laughs> I have done that. I have done that more than once. Um, and, and then you just spread them in a seeding flat. Now, let me just go over terminology. People ask me, so what is a hybrid, and how do I know whether I buy a hybrid seed? Well, Every catalog, this is Johnny's selected seeds. Do I buy some seeds from there? Yes, but I've been saving seeds for such a long time, I buy very, very few seeds. Uh, and of course, if, if, I have a, if I have a bad harvest, I could go to a catalog, but most often I store enough seeds so that I have enough for two, three years ahead. And in this case, 
you have not only designation of what it is, F1, for instance, that is hybrid, meaning the parentage you don't know. Now you can save the seeds from hybrid uh, plants, and you can try to derive the parentage. You can keep on seeding it and growing a population every year. For instance, many of you have heard of tomato called Sungo. It's a little yellow tomato, very, very sweet. So I saved the seed from it, and the seed germinates. Next year, I planted about 50 plants. Now, who needs 50 <laughs> cherry plants, right? But what I did was to grow them so that I could select what I want. Some I got orange gold tomatoes <coughs> like this, very early, in 50 days. That's a very desirable characteristic. Some were red cherries. They were this big. Some were sort of flattish red ones. And then I went again, and some, of course, were yellow like this. The question is whether they will retain the sweetness that the original plant had. So I picked a few, and I said, OK, these are little yellow ones uh, from sun gold. These are large orange ones from sun gold. These are the red ones from sun gold. And then I can take a few of each and then plant in the following year. And eventually, I probably could get something that would be a yellow sweet cherry. Not always, because sometimes I have, <coughs> I have grown beautiful, beautiful green pepper plants with one measly looking, sickly looking pepper. And of course, that's a waste of your energy, and that's a waste of your space and fertilizer and so on. But in experimenting, and what you can grow, you really discover a great deal about nature. And especially if you have children or grandchildren, you can take them to a garden and show them how the world works. One of the reasons I show a lot of pictures of flowers here is because we create a taxonomy or classification of how plants are related based on the flower shape. Now that has become a little old fashioned but you can see the relationship of plants based on the structure of their flowers. The reason it has become old-fashioned is because now we have DNA, and now we know that, for instance, human beings are very close to chimps, more close than to gorillas, and so on. That classification is based on DNA sampling. But if you look at, let's say, crucifera, which are also called brassicaceae, uh, brass Okay. or crucifera. It's a family of plants that you know very well. Some are annuals, some biennials. And the flower shape is like this. And that tells you what the why the family is named that way. Right? It's a cross. <laughs> and if you think about the relationship of those plants, it also will tell you about cultivation needs. For instance, radishes, cabbages, broccoli, arugula, and a myriad other plants belong to Crucifera family. They are really cold plants, meaning that they desire cold temperatures. If you have an open pollinated plant, you can save seeds without any problem. So if you have an open pollinated, it will be designated OP. Some people call open pollinated heirloom, but the heirloom has really no specific definition. It's just a way of marketing a plant that will be pollinated by either bees or wind. In other words, it's open pollinated. You can save seeds. There's no impediment. You don't need to know the parentage. Everything you see in front of you probably will be the same next year if you save the seed. So you can save seeds of heirlooms. You cannot save seeds of hybrids. And I mentioned the reasons. Obviously, you're not, you probably will not need to deal with plants that are genetically modified. They're too expensive. They're primarily grown in bulk. And no one wants a genetically modified miracle. It's too much effort to put into that what you need some 
to consider is the commercial aspect of a particular plant or flower. So that, um, I think I will stop here, and then maybe you have some questions that I could answer and, um, or help try to answer. I have a question. Do you have any, any way of keeping Japanese beetles away from the flowers? <laughs> Um, there really is no good way, but this is what I have been trying. One teaspoon of oil, any kind of oil. One more oil? No, no, no vegetable. Like vegetable. vegetable oil. Food. Vegetable oil. Food. You can have canola oil, olive oil, uh, rancid, it doesn't matter. And you add a teaspoon of uh, baking soda. Um, which is uh, sodium bicarbonate, okay, baking soda. In about a quart of water, you shake it up and you cover the plant with it. Generally, this is very good not only for, as an insecticide, but it's also good as a fungicide for, the, for uh, your leaves. Now, when would you spray? Obviously, you wouldn't spray a zucchini at the end of the season because it's not going to produce anything anyway. The reason it is susceptible to fungus is because it's the end of the season. There's not enough light. There's not, not enough strength for it to create chlorophyll. So it's more susceptible. So why waste your energy? It's going to die anyway, right? But in, in, uh, with Japanese beetles, I tried this on the grape arbor. I have cannabis grape arbor. But you have to be really diligent. It's very good for aphids. It will kill all aphids. So if you apply it every three days on a plant that has aphids, it will get rid of all the aphids. And then for maintenance, how often would you apply it? Well, what you're looking for is the germination or, or the hatching rate. rate right? If there are two kinds of propagation uh, methods for aphids. In the summer, they propagate asexually. So there are, uh, they pretty, you have a female, they are parthenogenic. So the female just keeps on laying eggs. It doesn't need a male. In the fall, they start becoming sexual. So how often? Probably every three, three days to seven days is the hatching rate. And the best time to get those, of course, is when they're very young, because they're the weakest at that point. How often do you apply that uh, vegetable oil and baking soda? Well, I do, it, I do it probably three to seven days. I, I go out and I look, and you can see. The Japanese beetles? Yeah. Uh, well, yes, Japanese beetles, probably every three days. Yes, I know, you can't do anything about Japanese beetles. They were imported to get rid of kudzu vines in the south. So you never know when you have yeah, biological controls, you never know the repercussions. It's, it's the benefit, cost-benefit ratio, and the cost of Japanese beetles, as now you can see, has outweighed the benefits of getting rid of kudzu vines. Uh, how do I know when I buy seeds whether they look hybrid or they are or not? Will it say it on the package? It should. I mean, if I buy them at, say, uh, Walmart or... Or uh, Walmart. Something like so. You Generally, they will say hybrid. Okay. Not always they will. But if, if they do in a good quality like Fedco, Fedco is a company based uh, in Waterville. It has a rag of a catalog is just from Newsprint, very ecologically sound. And you, it, will, it primarily prefers to sell seeds that are not hybrids. And I can't say that hybrid seeds are bad. It's just that you can't save them. And most of the time, you, your growing can be obviated by not having hybrid seeds. I, I know that there are some really very good peppers, for instance. Uh, you will go to the store and you will buy California Wonder Pepper. Never do that, because California is designed for California. 
it, it, it is not designed for our cool nights and hot days. So you, you have to have localized production. By saving your own seeds in your microclimate, you will be able to save plants that do very well. And that's why it's important to save your own seed, because you create greatest diversity. Farmers used to be able to do that. Now it's a lot easier to buy hybrid seeds. And of course, there's a financial consideration. In a home garden, you don't need to worry so much about finances. You're just raising what you need for yourself. Instead of raising ace pe pepper, for instance, which is a hybrid, I have, I have developed a variety of peppers, <coughs> a pepper called sweet chocolate. So now I have sweet chocolate which are green, they mature brown, and I have some that mature red, and they mature very early, and they uh, have sort of a thin skin. I have another one that someone left, and I don't even know the parentage of it. I call it Max, because a friend of mine, Max, at a wedding at the farm, and so I picked up this pepper, and I have grown it. It has, it's a four-lobe pepper, which is very good for stuffing, it has a very thick green skin. I mean, green uh, what? Uh, skin, yes, and, and very, very thick uh, outer shell, as opposed to thin, because that's also a characteristic that you choose. You you may want to have a pepper that is one lobe, or a two lobe, or a four lobe. If you look like this. And looks like skinny to think. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Edward, Edward Weston, was, uh, who, who was a great photographer, was enchanted by peppers, uh, by shapes of peppers. Always thought about the uh, the analogy that he can make to, to human bodies. And, and that's, that's what it reminded me. Uh, but. Any reputable catalog should give you a clue whether you're buying a hybrid or not. And most common herb seeds, for instance, will not be hybrids. There will be varieties. And the difference between a variety and a hybrid, of course, you should be able to answer now. A variety is just a particular race or, or variation on a theme. That's why it's called a variety. In fact, when you think about carrots, you think about carrots. Well, carrots, the botanical name for carrot is Daucus carota, OK? But it also is a subspecies carota carota. OK, that's the one that you buy in the store. You, if you travel in August and September along the roads of Maine, you will see Queen Anne's lace, right? Yeah. That's Douglas Carrara. That's this. Well, if you have this plant, wild one, blooming next to the plant that you're trying to save seeds from, they will cross. And so what will you get? You will get really, really <coughs> tough roots. They're great for decoration, but that's all. <laughs> you won't be able to save them. So you have to, in fact, separate. If you're trying to save seeds, I, I separate my pepper plants by tomato plants, for instance, or by marigold, by any flowers. That's why one of the reasons I have so many flowers in the garden is because if you separate with sufficient distance, that is if they're pollinated either by shaking or by bees. Because with peppers, bees are very lazy, so you really need to have them very close together. With tomatoes, you can pollinate them just by shaking them. So the wind pollinates them. But they're not wind pollinated. They're pretty much self-pollinated. Beans, for instance, are self-pollinated. They're pretty much enclosed. Beans and peas, a lot of legumes. They don't need any, anything else to pollinate them, though bees are attracted to alfalfa and to other legumes. And you can save seeds of legumes. You never need to buy seeds. Really, need, never. All you need to do, save the pods at the end of the season from what is left over from what you haven't eaten from string beans, for instance. 
and then all you need to do is crash them. And then you have more seeds than you can ever use. Um, any other questions? A big question for organic versus... Uh, organic. Uh, I don't know how to answer that because you don't really need to have organic seed in order to save it. On the other hand, organic is when you don't use sprays. So uh, sprays that are harmful. For instance, I use sprays and I use organic sprays meaning that they're accepted by organic association. But you can always start from something that is something that you buy commercially, and then you just propagate it yourself and it becomes organic. Because you don't use malathion or parathion or, or anything else that will kill you. Mark, um, you said that one way you could dry seeds was to put them on um, paper towels that they would stick. Um, and this past summer, I actually used gelatin on paper towels and put seeds on them to direct sow, um, which I didn't, I didn't, wasn't thinking about how I live in a wind tunnel, so when I walked out there, it was like I had sails in my hand. But, um, but I had um, learned about that technique for direct sow seeds, and I was wondering if you could just take the seeds and put them on paper towels at the spacing that you want to plant them next spring, and then direct sow them that way. You Would could, you could, and that's pretty much what tapes are. They're, they're like paper towels. The only problem is, if you have, you can buy carrot seeds because they're teeny, teeny, very small. That is, uh, and if you if you have a dry spell, and they start germinating in something in, in a medium in substrate that is wet, and it suddenly turns dry, that will impede germination. Another consideration is that each seed has a, a coat, right? And in certain seeds, that coat itself impedes germination. For instance, with a, with a brassica family plant, it's, a, it's called a woad, uh, which is used for, by, by weavers for uh, dyeing plants, or dyeing uh, cloth. Woad has a seed very much like this, but the coat itself impedes germination. So if you break the coat or scarify it, it's called scarifying, you will enhance germination. There are other plants that have to go through what is called stratification. Um, not so much with vegetable. But you need to stratify them, meaning you have to go, they have to go through a cold period. And a good example of those would be, for instance, uh, raspberry. Not only raspberry has to go through a cold period, but it has to go through a gut of a bird. So it, it is ground by the bird's uh, crop. And then it, is, it goes through acid and lime, and that makes the coat thinner. And then when the bird defecates, it drops the seed, the seed is able to germinate. Some seed is. So you have a very close relationship between animals, birds, plants, other animals. I mean, birds are... Uh, 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 animals that walk around, for instance, you, you've seen burdock, for instance, getting attached. Different <coughs> methods of dispersal. And it depends on that particular animal in order to disperse the seed. And of course, different plants also are affected different way in pollination. So some, if you're trying to see seeds from open pollinated corn, that is wind pollinated because it is a grass. What you need to do is separate it by at least 100 feet from other corn. More is better. Certain squashes cross with each other and you get some really weird shapes and of course you also get weird, really weird tastes. Uh, so you may not get what you want 
if you plant a particular plant close together. Cucumbers once in a while cross as well because bees jump from one cucumber to another. So you will, if you plant an Asian cucumber called Burpless or Shindaiwa or other, one variety, and you plant market more next to it, next following year you probably may get something very strange. But that very strange may be a good accident of fate because you say, oh, look at this one. It has a smooth skin, no spines, uh, it pickles well, and so on. So you may be able to arrive at something that is actually quite delightful. Do freezing temperatures for most seeds, though? Uh, if, you, if you keep seeds at very cool temperatures and dry conditions, they will last longer. Uh, there are seed banks, there are two or three seed banks in the world that dip all seeds of all kinds of varieties into liquid nitrogen and store those in liquid nitrogen. I recently bought some seeds through the mail mm -hmm. and I realized after I got them that they probably had been frozen in the mailbox and the trucks transporting them. So that's fine. fine. That, in fact, that's just fine. What the seeds you need to worry about are tropical plant seeds. For instance, if you got seeds from oranges or papaya or, um, or avocados that were sent through the mail when it's cold like it is now, then it's a waste of your money. But all, most of the seeds that we deal with don't, are not bothered. They can freeze and thaw. In fact, I keep these, these in, a, uh, in a very cold, uh, cold room in the bottom of the box. And they freeze and they thaw. It doesn't really matter. But I keep several years ahead, and I use the most recent ones. Eventually, I throw out the ones that are four or five, six years old, unless they're tomato seeds, which means that they will last longer. Yeah. These were scorpion duck peppers that I bought. So. Just fine. Don't worry. Any other questions? Is the process of re-parenting a hybrid, particularly peppers, very complicated? Not really. Uh, you, you, but you need a population, meaning you have to devote a, a certain amount of space. So if you have, if you're trying to uh, reparent it, and you have, if you have five plants. It's, it's a waste of your time. If you have 100 plants, yes, because inevitably you will get some that will not germinate, some that will germinate, produce beautiful plants, but no fruit, some that will germinate plant, will get odd fruit. There is someone I know who, uh, uh, Molly Thor Dixon in uh, Farmington, they have Kadigar Farm, and they, over a period of six years, rebred a, um, an onion seed that was hybrid, uh, cobra. And that's a very, very nice onion, very good storage capacity, and uh, that's very difficult to do. You need a very long period of time. But many times you can do it, but not always. It just depends on the variety. And of course, so no one will approach. I'm sorry? It's somewhat of a shot getting approach to do so many that a certain ratio will yield. Exactly. You're looking at ratios. That's why that's why any researcher works with statistics. You will get so many. And so many of the seeds that you say will germinate and so so you're looking for very good germination ratios as well. Any other questions? Can you talk a little bit about um, comb rotation and maybe how it's useful like at home instead of with big farms? Crop rotation, yes. You know, one of the biggest problems for most of us who, who have very small plots is difficult to rotate crops. If you have viruses uh, like, uh, or, or let's say you have fungi, Fungi are almost impossible to get rid of, like late blight or even early blight. So no matter, no amount of rotating 
in, in a space as big as this will help. So what the only option that I could offer is to stop growing a particular crop that is susceptible to that for a period of five years. That may work, that may not work. Of course, many of us till, you have fillers because that's the easiest way to disturb the soil. If you have separate beds, raised beds, that's, that's a good way of raising crops in a small garden. Of course, the cost of lumber or whatever else you use to contain the crop or the plants is, is an added cost. But it is good if you have a large area where you can crop at different times is to move. For instance, you know that brassica will not have the same diseases as carrots will, except Japanese beetles. <laughs> <laughs> But Japanese beetles go after broccoli, they go for, for basil. What is interesting is that if, you, if you're raising red cabbage and green cabbage, European cabbage butterfly is more attracted to green than it is to red. So it's quite unlikely that you will have a lot of damage. If you're, if you're raising opal basil as opposed to Italian sweet green basil. It's interesting that Japanese beetles are really not that attracted to the opal basil. And uh, that's, I mean, that's what I have noticed. They're not really attracted to lemon basil, which has very small leaves. So they're probably also making a judgment on cost benefit ratio, they say, maybe this one is just not worth it. And, and it also maybe that the green basil just makes them more sexy. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? How much uh, humus do you put in the, in your soil? Do you, at the end of the year, do you turn over everything back into the soil? I do. I, for most of the time, I, I put leaves in the garden and when I used to mulch with uh, hay, I would just till that in, which, you know, when hay or any grass rots, it releases a lot of nitrogen. It's very, very beneficial. It also breaks up clay soil and works up um, uh, sandy soils. So it, it's very beneficial. It retains moisture and it also allows too much moisture to per percolate out. I, when I had horses, I used exclusively horse manure because it's just so wonderful for that. It doesn't burn any plants. The best nitrogen-containing manure is hen manure, of course, bird guano. In fact, there were wars between Chile, Ecuador, and Peru over the islands off the coast uh, of Chile, which contained an enormous amount of, of guano, which was mined and then imported into the United States. With the advent of World War II, all of that guano was left alone because we got granular fertilizer, ammonium nitrate and all of that, uh, which provided the nitrogen, which is what is used now commercially, primarily that kind of fertilizer. But I put as much as I can and I buy now manure because I no longer have horses. About all the seaweed and seaweed. all that uh, that is very good. kind of... That is good. I spray my plants with fish emulsion and fish and seaweed emulsion. And that, um, well, I, I think it also repels deer. Uh, that's what I use it for, repelling deer, because deer don't like nitrogen. So if you, uh, if you can spray your plants that are uh, that you like with any nitrogenous compounds like blood meal or or fish emulsion, they won't they won't eat it until it's washed off. And then you have to reapply it. That's the problem about organic gardening. It just doesn't stick for a long time. Any other questions? If if you do go to a nursery and pick up some plants and plant those in. Now, how would you know whether or not you can use the seeds from those plants once? Uh, should they be labeled at the nursery? The nursery would know if they're hybrid or not, or? Most definitely, they should know. Just ask yes. before you. Okay. Yes, it should be on the label. <coughs> and 
and of course, a reputable nursery would. I'm not, I'm not saying that a large purveyor wouldn't know, but it's people who work, let's say, at Home Depot are less likely to know than people who raise their own seedlings and save their own seeds like little greenhouses around. Though a great amount of, of uh, seed, a uh, great number of seedlings now that are brought into Maine are brought in commercially that are already started. Though obviously if people have a greenhouse, they really should know whether it is a hybrid or not. And then after that, you will never need to buy seeds again. And then you can go into the garden, you explore, you say this plant, you say I like this one. You can even hybridize if you want to or, or create new varieties by snipping off the anthers from one plant and putting it, putting the, um, that right next to the pistol and you will get, um, you will get a different kind of plant. And you can do that with tomatoes. It's very, very easy to do. But you need populations, meaning that you need to put in the effort. But it's fun. It's, it's very enjoyable discovering. Any others? It's 20 off, and I don't want to keep you here. You speak about putting your seeds in the paper bag. Is it bad to put them in Ziploc plastic bags? Plastic bags, that's a good question. The reason you do paper is because it's breathable. And if it's very humid outside, it will absorb some moisture, but it won't sweat. And if the seed sweats, what happens is that you will get mildew on the seed. And then the mildew will, or fungus, will penetrate the seed coat and will go into the seed and make it not viable. So that's why you brown that. And uh, obviously you don't want high, a place where you store it to be high humidity. It's better to be warm and dry than cool and moist. Like never store anything in, in the garage or in the basement. The reason you don't store in the garage is because the cement floor is hygroscopic. It absorbs moisture during the day. It releases it at night and everything will mildew. You can use a very, very small percentage of Clorox water to rinse your seeds after you, uh, after you rinse them with regular water and spread them out to dry. And that will sterilize the outer coat so that it's less likely that you will get some fungus trying to uh, deposit itself in the drying process. Do you still sell plants at your place? No, I don't. Um, I can barely cope with <laughs> the responsibilities I have. Nice to buy out there. Yeah, I, I just have a big garden, too big for myself, but uh, good enough. So I, I enjoy it. I give away a lot of food that I raise, some seeds too. So if I'm buying heirloom tomatoes, either the seedling or Whole foods. What am I buying? Am I buying an open pollinated? Exactly. Tomato? Open pollinated, meaning that you can save seeds. It will pollinate by itself, or the bee will pollinate it, or uh, the wind will pollinate it. <coughs> so, what so I can take that tomato home, take the seeds out. Exactly. I was in Tuscany. I went to the farmer's market, and they, were, they had a uh, banana type pepper, which is long, like that. And it was this big, it was a uh, beautiful coloration, varying from <coughs> green through yellow through red. Of course, most peppers start out green, and they mature to either red or green or yellow or purple or other colors. So I asked the fellow whether it, I didn't ask him whether it was organic. I asked him whether it was, uh, it was uh, he saved the seed for it. He said, oh yes, I do. And I said, okay, I would like a couple of those. I took out the seeds and, and I, uh, I used them. Um, you can buy seeds from other countries. I used to buy a lot of seeds for eucalypti from, from Australia. Uh, you can, there are companies all over the place. But Petco is, is a good local seed company. 
you, there are also others that only sell open pollinated varieties, like Seeds of Change, for instance, is a company, I think it's based, uh, I don't know, Arizona. Uh, there are also seed savers exchanges all over the place. And you can, if you have an extra amount, you, you submit it to them and they will give you uh, also some. There are also some libraries. There are libraries that give you seeds in the spring and you're supposed to bring in the packet back in the fall. So you, you get refund when you bring seeds to them. That's a really clever way of creating great diversity of varieties. There was one more question. Well, actually, it was that I was going to mention the Auburn Library is running a seed bank. Ah, excellent. Yes. So that, that's a, a very good way, a way of doing it. So um, thank you very much. And uh, I'm here for another 15 minutes. I'll be glad to answer questions personally. I just don't want to keep everybody here. I have some books. If you would like one, you don't have to get one. And, uh, they're twenty dollars each, and um, Suzanne has has sheets. If you're trying to get credit for this course uh, or this uh, lecture, for uh, Rise Up, it's a main help. Do you know where uh, Milkweed?